Hey, good morning. Rock Church, good morning, good morning. Uh, what an amazing group of people. Uh, so, just so awesome to hear you worship Jesus Christ. I do want to welcome those online and for those at Rock Church San Ysidro right now, as uh, we have a ministry team of over 100 individuals that are there, they're prepping, they're setting up, they're watching online with us, joining us as we get prepared for our launch next month. Uh, so as the Rock Church continues to expand, I want to encourage you to continue to just pray about your involvement here. My name's Mickey, uh, Mickey Stonier, uh, Stonier, Stonier. Uh, again, don't call me Stoner, uh, it's just Pastor Stoner, it doesn't sound good, but uh, would you join me as uh, I know our pastor loves that we humble ourselves before God, that we're here to hear from God, to hear from Jesus. So would you, if you are physically able, join me by getting on your knees as we pray together. Lord, such an honor to be with such amazing people, and yet we have an amazing God who desires to you desire to minister to us, to instruct us, teach us, encourage us, to correct us. I pray that all that are here and those watching online at San Ysidro, those in our microsites and here in Point Loma, that we would have a listening ear to hear what your spirit would say to us as we exalt and seek to exalt Jesus Christ. This ministry is about you, uh, not about any of us, and so we, we want to humble ourselves before you and pray that you would have your way in our lives, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, as you take your seats, give someone a hug. Give them some love. If you're new to The Rock, I, I wanna welcome you. Uh, our pastor will be back uh, soon here on Sundays. It's an honor as one of the pastors to be able to serve you. We're going to be looking at a portion of the scripture in John chapter 10 this morning. And so take out your iPhones, your iPads, your smartphones, your dumb phones, whatever. Uh, or if uh, you have a, a Bible uh, that is in printed form, uh, take that out as well just to, as we'll focus on that scripture. You know, there's a woman in this church that I've gotten to know. She has such an amazing story. She was raised uh, one of seven children. She's in the middle of seven kids. Her mother had mental illness. Mother got pregnant as a teenager, had a child every year, and had multiple personalities. She, the oldest, remember her actually changing. Her tone, her look would change. You see, her mother was molested as a child impacted her so dramatically. She had multiple personalities. She actually tried to kill her husband by grinding up glass in his meatloaf. She was eventually institutionalized. Her husband divorced her. This little girl grows up not having any memory of her mother at all. She was four when her mother moved. Her mother ended up getting out of the institution and went to Golden Gate Bridge and took her life, jumping off the bridge. And uh, growing up in a home like this, very dysfunctional, everyone was on their own. They went in to foster care for a while. As a young teenager, she ended up dropping out of school. The brothers, sisters all got into drugs, and her younger brother dropped out of school in junior high. She dropped out of school her senior year, got a job, moved in with a guy, and worked and went from person to person, was engaged, and then broke that off, and eventually ended up in San Diego, met some people living a fast life, and uh, was in Las Vegas for a little bit, dated movie stars, uh, new people at the track, movie stars, and uh, at one point just uh, took on a job. She was dealing cards on El Cajon Boulevard in a card room. Ended up moving in with the owner of the card room, got engaged, he's 20 years older than her, and her brother had come to the Lord and gave her a Bible. And she started to read the scripture. She was raised Catholic, went to Catholic school. But it was religion. You know, God was out there. And she started to read the scriptures in the gospels and started to believe. 
and her life slowly started to be transformed through scripture. I, so pleased, I mean, I love to hear stories like that because I, was, I came to faith not at a church or at a, an event, but by reading the gospels. I started to read and I believed and it changed my life, my worldview and everything. Now I know this woman really well. I married her. It's my wife. Now, now, if you knew my wife, and those of you that know your wife, it's like she was raised a Christian. You know, if anyone should have baggage and dysfunction and just struggling, all the triggers in life, it'd be my wife. But I have seen a miracle of transformation of what God's word does with a believing soul. And so I, I want to encourage you, this is not about a religion. It's not a bunch of rules and obligations and duties. God desires a relationship, and he desires to transform our lives. As you were singing, and I, I know that some of you maybe are a little distant from the Lord right now. God loves you so much. In fact, I know he loves you just the way you are if you come to him in faith. But he loves you so much he won't leave you the way you are. He wants so much of his love to pour in your life that this work of transformation of all the excuses and baggage and hurts and wounds and trauma could be transformed as you become more like Jesus Christ. It's referred to by John as the life. The life. It's this life in Jesus Christ. Now here in Verse 10, I'll, I'll begin there. I'm sorry, verse 7 in chapter 10 of the Gospel of John. I'll read out of the New King James Version. It says, Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Now he says, I'm saying to you again. Well, he's talking to a group of people. This is a carryover of chapter 9. A man born blind from birth. He was blind from birth. Jesus heals him. And the religious leaders got upset that Jesus was not doing things the way that they understood that God should work. You see, it was on a Sabbath. It was on a Saturday, a day of rest. Not so much that they were concerned about a man born blind that was healed, and so they started to attack Jesus, causing division, causing question in people. And at the end of that that chapter of chapter 9, he says, if you were blind, you would have no sin, but now you say we see, therefore your sin remains. And he starts to tell a story about a shepherd and how certain people uh, are keeping people out of the sheepfold, referring to the, the Sadducees and the, the Pharisees. And he tells them this parable, but they, they didn't really understand the illustration he was giving, so he says it again in more detail. So he says, I am the door of the sheep. Now, all who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. Now, we're going to put up a, a picture of what he's referring to here of a shepherd, as the shepherds would tend the flock out in the field in Judea, uh, very rocky ground, not a lot of fertile grass for the sheep. He says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and I will go in and out, uh, they, and will go in and out and find pasture. Um, we have a sheepfold there in Israel that is literally a, a bunch of rocks that are piled and has an entrance. And at the entrance there is where the shepherd traditionally would lay down at night. And often sheep would come from different flocks, they'd gather, they'd go into the pen, and a shepherd would lay there to keep the predators out and to keep the sheep in. So when Jesus says, I am the door, you can't get in except through me. It's very exclusive. He is guarding that door. There's only one way in, and that's through Jesus Christ. And he says in, in verse uh, 10, he says, the thief, does not come except to steal and to kill, kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. 
This morning, I, I do want to speak about this concept of about abundant life. But there's a shepherd. There's two kinds of shepherds. There's hirelings, false shepherds. There's wolves. Uh, and the good shepherd, the true shepherd. Now, I know not all of you were here last week, but our pastor, Miles, gave, had a letter written. And uh, you can uh, call the office, or uh, I'm not sure how to acquire it. It might be on our Facebook page where you can see the letter if you missed it. But it was our shepherd's heart for us as a, a flock. You see, this past month, he's been ministering all over the world. He's been on the radio, TV, and travel. And to do Sunday plus travel can be overwhelming. And then he's just this weekend going on vacation for a couple of weeks, and will be back with us. And so we have uh, Pastor Ricky will teach next week, and then Bob Goff, an author, speaker, uh, just love it. And then Pastor Miles will be here. But in his letter, he said this, as he felt God was speaking to him to be a better shepherd that is more caring, a leader that is ruthlessly focused, and a messenger that has a double portion of God's anointing and power. You see, shepherd, in fact, God is referred to as a shepherd of God's people in Psalm 23 and Psalm 79, Psalm 80, Isaiah 40. God is the good shepherd. Here, Jesus says, he's going to say he's the good shepherd. I was in Israel uh, a while ago, and I saw a gentleman, he was just smacking on the sheep and pressing and pushing them forward. And, and I said to our tour guide, I said, that shepherd seems so harsh with the sheep. He's driving the sheep rather than leading the sheep. To which the tour guide said, oh, that's not a shepherd, that's a butcher. <laughs> taking them to slaughter. You know, there is a butcher who lies, steals, seeks to kill and destroy and divide. We have an enemy. You know, and I heard this week, Robin Williams and, and the fact that he took his life as he struggled with depression. I, I read an interview a number of years ago where he shared he had this void in his heart, a hole in his heart that he couldn't fill with all that the world had to offer. Of course, I know Scripture talks about that, that void is God, and yet he struggled with depression, and yet I know that Christians also can struggle with depression because depression has many contributors. You can be a Christian and yet there's physiological challenges, there's trauma in the past that we work through and sometimes people do need medication, they need counseling, they'll benefit, but this, this just the horrendous. I, I know he was listening to a lie, saying you're worthless, there is no hope, you're helpless. That is common in all the the issues of, of, of suicide, the, there's lies coming to it. I'm going to share a statistic. It's in your bulletin. Most of you will not believe me. My PhD is actually in marriage and family, and in my graduate studies, I saw these stats and the accurate information, and I was like, why are we being lied to? If I asked you, what's the divorce rate, most of you here would say, oh, 50%. 50% of marriages divorce. Well, that comes from a statistic in our county, county recorders. Last year, there were 27,536 marriages. Last year, there were about 12,000 divorces, 13,000 divorces. There it is. Half of the number of marriage licenses, there are half the amount of divorce licenses. And so 50%, well, the divorces are made up of second marriages, third marriages, fourth marriages. That skews the statistic. We have a book in our bookstore. It's listed there in your study guide. If you question my statistic, I'm going to give it. They do a thorough job, very conservative, very conservative. Do you know what the actual statistic on first-time marriages, divorcing? 72% of first-time marriages are still together. The divorce rate, because if you include widowhood, is closer to about 20% in our country. And the divorce rate is dropping. 80% of those that are married say they are happy in their marriage relationship. 93% say that if they could do it over again, they'd marry the same person. Now you're having a hard time because you're thinking, that's just not true. That's just not true. Well, you've been conditioned by a lie to take away the hope. You see, when people think 50% of marriages end in divorce, you go through a hard time. Well, I guess we must well give up. We're a statistic. 
You know, I was wanting to get a car a couple of years ago, I bought a used car, and I just needed transportation to and from work, I want a good gas mileage, and, and so I thought, what would be a good car for Mickey? Well, of course, I bought a Mini. You know, Mickey, Mini, you know, we kind of go together and all of that. And so when I got my car and I'm driving on the freeway, it was like every third car was a Mini. I had no idea there were so many Minis on the road. I, I didn't notice it before, they were always there, but now I was looking for them. And you know, when I look for divorce, I'll see it everywhere, but when I look for marriages, first time marriage, they are pervasive, it's everywhere. Now I share this just as an example that every day you have a voice trying to take away hope, trying to change your perspective when God all along, he says, come to me. All you that labor and are heavy burden, he desires to take our yoke, to take the burdens, to give us this life called abundant life. Now that word abundant, it's actually a Greek word, mean, uh, parasos, which is translated extraordinary, remarkable, exceptional, exceeding the usual the exceptional life that God has for his children. But yet I know some of you here, many of us, like Peter, when he denied Jesus, when he was arrested, in Matthew 26, verse 58, it says, Peter followed at a distance. He knew if he was close, there would be persecution, there would be all the other issues that he would deal with, and yet his heart was broken, and and so he saw Jesus being led to Caiaphas, and in the courtyard, Matthew cites that he was following at a distance. I find that to be very common for many Christians. They've entered into this relationship with God, and yet we, we get tripped up on religion and obligation, so we only go so far, and, and then eventually we start to critique or even criticize, or we're bothered by inconvenience. I, I've had people say that, you know, I, I meet them, ah, I used to go to the Rock Church, but it's so big, and there's such a crowd there. And yet they have season tickets to the Charger games. They have season tickets for, they just will fork out dollars after dollars to go to Padre games, to fight the crowds, to get an uncomfortable seat. Get this, you have season tickets for your whole family, family package here at the Rock, 52 weeks a year for free. For free. Now, there may be traffic at times, but let me share this. This is not a big church. It's not. A lot of us come together to worship, to experience God together as a large group, but this church is made up of a lot of small communities, life groups, small groups, where we experience ministry together, we do things together. My challenge, though, is I've met so many people that are just not connected not part of this vision, not part of the ministry because you, and not at all as criticism, please hear my heart, that you, you're kind of a spectator and almost a consumer where you, know, you come, you check in and out, and again, my heart is not at all criticism because we don't want anything from you as leaders of this church, it's all for you. And it's this life that God has for you but it's to take that step to say, God, I, I do want you to be the center of my life. I do want this life. I, I am being lied to. As we read on here in John chapter 10, verse 11, he says, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd, shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. The wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. Again, he repeats, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I am known by my own. You know, it's God's desire that you would know him and be known by him. It's this amazing relationship. 
You know, I uh, have a a nephew, he's in special forces. We were just up in Seattle for a family vacation, my in-laws, and my nephew is just back, and he's just like, I love what I do, he said. I jump out of planes with scuba gear, we land in water at dark and shed our, you know, our uh, parachute, and then I'm underwater, and he says, I do all these jumps and stuff, and I'm just like, you're just insane, the stuff, and, and all that they're trained for, you know, to care and protect. And when one of their operations they're doing at airports to retake airports that have been taken over by, uh, you know, uh, terrorists and things. And he said, when we land, we have three objectives immediately. One, we need to know our position. I need to know where I am in relationship to the mission. He says, number two, I need to know where my enemy is. And then he says, number three, I need to find my buddy. We don't do this alone. We always have a partner. You see, we have here at the Rock Church something called the life. We have life classes, life groups, but it's an acronym, uh, L for loving relationships. You see, in producing this life of Christ, we need, it's done in relationship. God created us in his image, not alone. Uh, When Adam was alone, it wasn't good. We were created to reflect God. God was triune and Father, Son, Holy Spirit, always in relationship throughout eternity. And so to love God, to love each other is part of this transformation that takes place. I stands for impacting ministry. You see, Jesus calls us into ministry. Today at the life class, this afternoon, they, you will study and learn the design, different assessments to see your gifts, your passions, your calling, that you would be using your gifts to fulfill what God has for you. F is for faithful stewardship, to be steward over your time, talent, and treasure, and E for evangelizing the lost, that Jesus came to win the lost, to fulfill his great commission. That's, we exist together to experience this life of transformation as his life becomes our life. And once again, the classes we have, right after this service, over in the lobby, there's an area set up called life groups where you can connect, meet buddies, have a buddy, to be on mission together as we fulfill the great commission of Jesus Christ. It's right outside here on the way to the bookstore, rock pile, um, and they'll help you get connected. And maybe the first group you go in, yeah, I didn't connect there. Well, there's five, over 500 other groups to get. And if you can't find one you like, start a group. And if you go through all 500 and they don't connect with you, I don't think the group's probably the problem. <laughs> Let us help you become who God has asked you to be. You know, I work with the fire department as a chaplain. I get calls every now and then. Uh, to respond this week, there was a, a SIDS death at a child care facility down in San Ysidro. I was there for the firefighters, just working through to give chest compressions on a two-month-old. It just rocks your world. And then to be with the, the dear woman, you know, just she put the child down for a nap and went, went to check on him later. He was not breathing. But I can't tell you what an honor it is to represent you out in the community and to tell this dear family you know, right across this freeway there, you can see it. There's a high school campus called San Ysidro High School. We have a church that's starting there. And we want to be there for you to provide hope and comfort. I had a firefighter contact me. He, he, I'd seen him at fire station. He had cussed me out before. He's just a man's man, a womanizer, all of this. Just uh, gnarly. When the chaplain's there, he'd always try to egg me and push me over the edge, and just, and I said, you got issues, you know. All of a sudden, I get a call, months later, get a call from him. He says, chaplain, I need to come talk to you. I go, sure, when, when, he goes, today. I'm like, okay, uh, I'm free this afternoon, I'll be there, what time? I'll come to your office. He comes to my office, he's there. I don't know if he's gonna beat me up or what, but I'm like, <laughs> Better get 911 ready. And so I, I get there, I open the door, he comes in. I go, what can, Nick, what can I do for you? He sits down in a chair in my office. I close the door. He buries his face in his hands and just starts to weep. He said, the way I've chosen to live my life, I've lost my family, I've lost my wife, I've lost my kids. I've ruined my life. And then he said, what do I need to do 
to get right with God. How can I be saved? You know, it's pretty awesome when the fish come jumping in the boat, you know? It's like, <laughs> whoa, this is awesome, you know, and unexpected. Fishing's good here. Well, I explain the gospel to him, Jesus Christ. You don't have to work your way to God. You don't have to be good enough. It's not by improving yourself that God so loved you that he sent his only begotten son into the world to die for you, for all of this mess. He says if you'll confess that Jesus is Lord, that he's who he says he is, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, as he says in verse 18 here, the Bible says you believe that, confess it, you will be saved. You enter into the sheepfold through Jesus Christ. He prayed right there, weeping, praying, and we hugged, embraced, helped him get started on his growth. He went back to the fire station. In fact, uh, week after week, he was at different stations take, doing wheel work or working at other stations. And then he finally calls me up and tells me, you know, he says, I am just overwhelmed. He says, I've gotten real bold. And then he tells me a story. He went to this one station, and there's another firefighter, and he just tells them all, I'm a Christian now. I'm living for God, my life's been transformed and I'm on a journey to become more like Jesus Christ. And a firefighter at this station told him, he'd known him for 25 years, says, hey, I'm a Christian too, praise the Lord, brother. And with tears welling up in his eyes, he says, how dare you tell me you're a Christian? I worked with you for 25 years and you never once told me about Jesus Christ. You should be ashamed. Of course, this response, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Sometimes I'm not where I need to be, and he wasn't on track with his mission, and so Nick gets to pray with him and get him on track. You know, in Scott Air Force Base, there's this sign as you enter. It says, an untrained soldier is just a target. <laughs> you know, why is it we get off mission? Why is it we get off course? I, I was playing paintball with a bunch of pastors and we had a Navy SEAL guy who was retired with us and I got first pick, I picked him. <laughs> we're playing capture the flag. We played this game, within 10 minutes the game was over. No one, I'm not exaggerating, no one ever saw him the entire game. <laughs> and he's at our end zone saying, game over and he's holding the flag. And I said to him, you didn't fire one shot. He said, the goal wasn't to shoot or be shot. The goal was to capture the flag. I, what'd you do? He goes, I was in the shadows, crawling the whole way there, whole way back, got their flag, and I'm back. <laughs> and they say, well, that's not fair. We get him on our team. And so we said, okay, we'll take him. He's on your team. The next game, we were at there, was, there were buildings and all this stuff, and I was with one of the other pastors, and I said, okay, you go around this side, I'll go around this way. And so we go running around, and all of a sudden, bam, 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 I got shot three times in the back. I'm out, I'm out, I'm out. Those things hurt. I have a scar here. <laughs> I got a ring scar from a pastor that decided to shoot me from behind in the neck from six inches. <laughs> okay. Praise the Lord, brother, you know, it's just like, bam, you know. A lot of fun that is. Well, I get taken out, and I turn around, how oh, I'm out, I'm out, and it was the guy on my team. He goes, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I was so excited, you know, you were the first thing I saw move, so I shot, you know. <laughs> I'm like, that so describes the church often. We're just all going, doing what we want to do, and not necessarily on track. And we start shooting at each other. Start criticizing other parts of the body of Christ. Let that not be our hearts. You know, the Baptists, the Lutherans, the Pentecostals, conservatives, they're all part of our team. Though some are Marines, some are Army, some are Navy, they wear different color uniforms. We have the same mission. Let's love one another. Let's serve together with one another. Again, I share that you know, this, this desire, the life paradigm, is not about getting you to do something, though that results, it's getting you to fall more in love with Jesus Christ because it becomes natural for you to do what you were designed for. We have fill-ins in your, your 
study guide there. Let me surprise you. Here, I'm, you're going to church. Don't tell Miles. Pastor Mickey said, stop going to church. Stop serving the church. Stop getting into the Bible. What was that about? Well, no, still go to church, still serve, still get in the Bible, but there's a nuance. When we leave religion and really experience life, you see, stop going to church and be the church. One of our production team, Chris, he has a passion for people and people coming to know the Lord. And he organized friends and, and staff and just said, hey, how about we, we're all busy, but once a month we get together for lunch. Go to dinner or lunch. And we target a waiter or waitress that we know is struggling financially. And we all just go, we'll fellowship together, but we'll tip extra on purpose. And so it's like 50 people all committed to this. Even if you don't go, you throw in 10 or $20 just to bless this person. Uh, we went, the month I went just last time was, we went, there's just probably 10 or 12 of us. We got our lunch and the bill was like $130, $140. Everyone paid the bill. And then the tip was in a card with the gospel presented and just love. And there was $550 as a tip. I thought, that is the way the church should be. That is fulfilling a mission. That, I, I get it. We're together, part of another kingdom to love people. Be the church. Stop serving the church and start serving Jesus. You see, you'll get burnt out if you serve people. They're going to wrong you. There's injustice. There's lack of fairness. It's just it's inconvenient. Things don't do things right. But when you serve Jesus, inconvenience doesn't matter. You see, I have an audience of one. Lord, I do this for you, in you, through you, because of you. And not because I have to, it's him in us. And finally, stop getting into the Bible, but get the Bible into you. It's not about more information, but it's about transformation. Here, there, John Piper on your study guide out of Desiring God, a famous quote, he says this, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. If Jesus is all you have, is it enough? Is he enough? I have on the flip side a, a quote by Henry Skugel. He is a, actually a Scottish theologian back from another generation, an amazing quote that I believe probably influenced John Piper's quote. He says this, the worth and excellency of a soul is to be measured by the object of its love. We are most satisfied when we seek God's pleasure above our own. And we gradually become conformed to what we most love and admire. We do not exist for ourselves. We exist for the Father and through the Son. Our souls become emaciated when our pleasure is affixed to position possessions, and power, because these things are destined to corrupt and perish. God is most glorified when we are most satisfied in him. Let me share with you, this man wrote a book called The Life of God in the Soul of Man. I realize there's probably no greater summary of the Christian faith than the life of God in the soul of men and women. That book was foundation that led to the great uh, awakening in America. This man spoke five languages, Greek, Hebrew. He wrote numerous books, was a professor of theology and a pastor, and he died at 27 years of age, accomplishing so many things because he had the life, this relationship with God. You see, the I am's of John, John wrote to expose people. He wanted people to believe. In chapter 20, 31, he says, I, I've written you this, that you would believe that Jesus Christ is God's son. And he reveals that Jesus is the bread of life, the light of the world, the door, the shepherd, resurrection and the life. The seven I am's of the gospel of John really reflect or mirror the seven I am's of the Old Testament where God says, I am that I am. And then we see he is, I am, Rapha, Shalom, Yaira, uh, Nisi. I am the healer, peace, provider, banner, righteousness. God is life. And let me just share one last verse and we'll close in prayer together. 
See, John was an elder statesman. All the other apostles uh, were martyred earlier in their faith. He lived to be in his 90s. At the end of his life, he's in Ephesus. And he writes probably 60 years later after this encounter with Jesus Christ, and he writes 1 John. And there, this life that he heard of his Messiah talking about. I know there's pain, I know there's sorrow, there's grief, there's anxiety, there's people turn to drugs, they turn to illicit relationships, they try to fill the void, seeking for hope, and yet all along God is there saying, I am life. As he wrote there in 1 John, there in your study guide, it says, and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. Literally, there's a definite article there. Better translation is the life. And I believe he's referring to this life, this abundant life. He who has Jesus has the life. He who does not have the son of God does not have the life. These things, he says, I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Don't sell yourself short. God loves you so much. This is the life he has for you. And he says, believe. And so I, I want to pray. And I'm going to ask you to be honest with God, transparent. As you sit here today, some of you have Jesus at arm's distance. You're following at a distance. God knows that. But he's bidding you to come closer in, to embrace this life. You're missing. You know, it's, how's life working for you? Your relationship, struggling, you're anxious, you're struggling with so many aspects of life. He's inviting you to experience a richer love, a richer transformation. We all have baggage, we all have dysfunction, but God will move that into a purpose and make it beautiful if you just let him in, let him have control. And so I wanna pray, and I'm gonna ask those of you that maybe have never received Christ to pray, to receive him. Or those of you that need to return, and here at The Rock, we wanna make it public, so I'm gonna ask you to stand and ask you to come to the altar because we want to give to you steps to help you in this life to grow. Nothing from you. Would you pray with me? Lord, I, I know you're here. I know your promises are true. Eternal life is before us, and that life begins now. And yet I, I know so many have been listening to a lie, feeling hopeless, helpless, discouraged, feeling fail, like they're failing, they feel that you're mad at them, that they're not worthy enough, and yet you invite us to come, to believe, to confess. And so if that's you this morning, I'm going to ask you to let your pride go as we started on our knees, that in your heart you'd take this place of humility and say, God, I, I'm tired of fighting the battle, I'm tired of living for myself and being on the throne of my heart, take me. If that's your prayer, say, Lord Jesus, I do believe. I believe that you are the Son of God that was crucified for me. I, I repent. I, I pray you change my life and set me on a course of transformation. I give you my heart and ask that you come into my life and restore what the enemy has taken. Take the brokenness. Bring healing. Be my provider. Be my light, my life, my Lord and Savior. In the quietness of this moment, as heads are bowed, eyes are closed, if that's been your prayer, I'm gonna, I know there's a voice probably coming to many of you saying, no, don't, no, you're good enough. You're, and God is whispering to you, let me love you. Let me transform you. Let me take the ashes of your life and exchange it for beauty take that step of faith, would you? If you prayed that prayer, and it's your time,
to acknowledge him as your life. I'm going to ask you to stand right where you are. Take a bold stand and say, Jesus, I want that for me. Take a stand right now, right where you are, if you prayed that prayer. God bless you. God bless you. I know there's more. God bless you. Up in the balcony. Take that stand. Don't hold back. God bless you, sir. God bless you, sir. Keep standing. I'm going to ask you not to rush out right now as we honor these individuals. I know that God is still speaking to some of you and there's a battle going on. And Admit it. Admit you're not where you need to be. And that you would admit that I need God to give me this life, to let him be God. And those of you standing or up in the balcony as well, the ushers will help guide you down. I'm going to ask you to come up here as we celebrate with the angels of heaven as you make that commitment to him to walk closer in his love. So come on, join us up here. Come out of your aisles and come. We want to celebrate with you. God bless you. God bless you. Come join us. You know, I, I want to thank you and honor you for your commitment. You know, it's a crazy thing that God does in our life, and everyone here has either been here or needs to still be here or has been in this place of this battle. God so loves you, so loves you, has so much more for you. And you're a miracle in the making of what God wants to do through you. And it's our team that we just want to come alongside you, not take from you, but to give to you the steps to encourage you and to be there for you through this. Let me pray for you, would you? Uh, bow your hearts. Lord, you see these precious individuals as they're on this journey with you. I, I don't know their stories. You do. Some for the first time are making this commitment. Others still struggling and want more of the abundant life. Pray you honor their commitment that you pour upon them and pour in them your love, that they would know you and be known by you. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Have you turn to your right. Turn to your right as they're going to be there for you. God bless you. <laughs> Hallelujah. God bless you. Bless you.